So, I first I have to give you just a little bit of background. Uh, Ella, and did you notice I did a special shout out to those of you who've been really regular at attending these live Tuesday sessions. Thank you. Thank you for being faithful that way. It works. Uh, it really works the best when we're when we're on live, and uh, I just appreciate some of you have been very faithful on that. So I have this series. I've been working on it for I don't even want to tell you how many years, but it, you know, I nineteen seventy eight is when I started working on this. I know a long time, and I can't put it down. And it relates to the mathematical design in God's creation. And here, this time, uh, we have a perfect fit for calculus students. This particular aspect of my series is called divine design. Uh, but, and this particular one, I think I've got eight parts now, this particular one is called optimal design. Now you recall, we were doing optimization, I don't know, about three or four lessons ago. And this relates to that, mostly to the derivative and how we can literally find max and min and uh, how our creator has used max and min all the time in his creation. Um, so we'll get started here. Uh, just to share, I mean, a special passage right in Genesis, right after creation. I love that. Very good. But it's just a uh, uh, very modest way of saying, boy, it was perfect. And of course, we we now live after the fall and creation is groaning, waiting for Christ to return again. But nevertheless, what an awesome creation. And even in the groaning and the fall, amazing the optimization that we find in God's creation. Another one of my favorites is Philippians 4.8. Um, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So we're going to think about such things this morning. So... If you're new to my series, which most of you are, I'm uh, very fond of scientist, mathematician, Johannes Kepler. Uh, Kepler, you know, hit the laws, some of the major laws of the universe are credited to him. They're called Kepler's laws. Um, the big one for us, I think, is that we are on a mathematical ride around the sun once a year. It's an ellipse. A mathematical shape and Kepler spent a number of years of his life discovering that but you're going to notice in my quotes today this idea of optimization here's what Kepler said nature uses as little as possible of anything in other words it's, it's as efficient as it can be this was said a little differently by this French mathematician who said Nature always operates with the greatest possible economy. Um, you know, one of the discoverers of calculus, Isaac Newton, he said it this way, nature does nothing in vain, and more is in vain when less will serve, for nature is pleased with simplicity and affects not the pomp of superfluous causes. No waste, very efficient. And another Christian mathematician, Leonard Euler, said, because the shape of the whole universe is most perfect and in fact designed by the wisest creator, nothing in all the world will occur in which no maximum or minimum rule is somehow shining forth. So you can tell I'm not alone in my, uh, in my admiration for the work the creator has done. And how about Leonardo da Vinci, Renaissance man, scientist, inventor? He said, human ingenuity may make various inventions, but it'll never devise any inventions more beautiful, nor more simple, nor more to the purpose 
than nature does. Because in her inventions, nothing is wanting and nothing is superfluous. So we really have pretty universal agreement among these gentlemen. There is a center for biomimetics. By the way, biomimetics is copying God's design and capitalizing on them in human inventions. And the Center for Biomimetics, as you can tell, in England, uh, this is their theme. Nature works for maximum achievement at minimum effort. And, you know, a good the calculus student that you are, you are very familiar with those terms, maximum and minimum. So we take a look at, we take a look at the, the sine curve, cosine curve. And we just think so many things fit this light waves, sound waves, radio waves. Um, and this idea that a sine curve goes from maximum to minimum and back again in as smooth a, as smooth a way as it can. And uh, I mean, even, even our seasons uh, follow this mode as we are, as we are, you know, trying as we now are, what, somewhere in the middle, of, uh, heading up on this curve right here, eventually we'll get up to summer where we have the higher temperatures and growth. And then growth slows down. We get into fall season. Temperatures get their lowest. We're back to the pits of winter. And um, after the flood, God promised to keep sending this cycled pattern, the seasons until he returns again for the second time. So this is just an animation of that famous curve, and uh, it just shows in animation that we go from a max to a min to a max to a min, and the cycle continues. I'm going to bypass this because we didn't have any time to go through this, but uh, uh, another optimal solution that's all over in God's creation. So let's go to this mathematical uh, geometry problem. <clears throat> Here we have two points off of a line. And the goal is, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, the goal is to find the shortest path from A to B bouncing off of the line. A real elegant, simple solution that a regular high school geometry student can find. And then uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a close look at this problem. So it's pretty simple. What you do is you first find A's reflective partner on the opposite side of the line, equidistant away. Real easy to do with a compass. And once you've got that A prime point, connect it back to point B. And where that line we just drew crosses the line, point C, that's the perfect bouncing point. So this red path is perfect. I mean, that's the path that's the small, the, the minimum path from A to B bouncing off the line. Um, I find it rather remarkable that something that's great little primary grade school kids can understand symmetry was really the key to finding the solution. We could have done it the other side, too. We could have reflected B and then connected that way, and that would have found the same point. Notice what we've got here is certainly uh, is certainly founded on symmetry. Now, since we're good calculus students, oh, let me just make this claim one more time. That red path is the best, the minimum distance that um, it, it's the best way to solve the problem. And you know how it is with calculus. We, we don't just say it's good. We, we say it, it's the best. And we're going to use some calculus to kind of demonstrate that. So what I've done is I've kind of recreated the situation um, with, some, with some letters and some angles. And you can see we have a... We have a um, We have a right triangle on the left here. And I have written the Pythagorean theorem down here that fits that. 
if you take the one leg, B, that's squared, plus the other leg, X, and square it, you get the hypotenuse, which at the moment we're just calling BP squared. Also, on the right, we've got a right triangle over here, too. And again, now, maybe you need to see why I called this part right here C minus X. Well, the whole distance from here to here is C. This distance is X. Therefore, this must be C minus X. So if you take that C minus X squared as a leg and then square the other leg, A, that'll equal the hypotenuse AP squared. Okay, so just a couple of Pythagorean theorems. Now, it's this distance, BP plus AP, that I claimed was the minimum distance. So that's where we're headed. So if I just uh, take the square root of both sides, we've got an expression for the one distance, BP, and over here, same thing, we've got an expression, I squared the C minus X. We've got an expression for AP. And if we add those two together, we should have the distance. I don't know why I called it T, but this is our, the distance that I claim is minimum. When, uh, yeah. So anyway, so now guess what? How do we find minimum in calculus, of course, we take a derivative. Uh, I rewrite this first in exponential form. And then, now you got to remember, A, B, and C are constants. Obviously, X is our variable. So we take the derivative. And you can see I use the power rule. We have two things to take the derivative of. And notice I had to use the chain rule. So in both cases, I had to multiply by what? Uh, a quantity. On the first one, I had to multiply by the 2x. And on this one, I had to multiply by, you know, the coefficient negative 2c plus, and then this derivative, 2x. So we've got our derivative now. So what does a good calculus student do with a derivative if they want to find a min or a max? they set the derivative equal to zero. Now, when I set it equal to zero, I rewrote it back in algebraic form. So the b squared plus x squared to the minus one half power became what? A root in the denominator and likewise on that second part. All right, so I've got my two distances, my two derivative parts added up and set equal to zero. Then um, I, I subtracted the second fraction from both sides. That causes the numerator to be reversed. And so now I've got this form. And now I just turned, you know, what's the square root of b squared plus x squared? It's the hypotenuse, bp. And what's the square root of that? thing on the right on the denominator, that's that other hypotenuse, AP. And so you see I have a proportion. X is to BP as C minus X is to AP. And there's a little bit missing here, but if you add in a little bit of angle work, in effect, we've got, th this shows me that triangle BCP is similar to triangle ADP. And if the, ang if the triangles are similar, that means the angles are congruent. And so we, we've just proven um, that really, when, when those two angles are equal, that theta 1 and theta 2 are the angles in the triangle, this one right here and this one, are congruent. I mean, it, it just proves that old scientific principle of what? The angle of incidence equals the angle of coincidence. Um, and every time that will give you not just a distance, but the minimum distance. Here is just a view of a laser being reflected, and it just shows that light always makes these two angles equal. And here's the amazing part. Light always travels the path 
that will get it there the quickest. In other words, it always takes the minimum path to get to its destination. Always, uh, just the way God created light, it always uses the most efficient, the optimal solution. Here we see a couple mathematical uh, skeletons and when they're dipped in a soap solution you can see the results this is pretty amazing the soap solution automatically goes to the configuration that has minimum surface area and holds the most volume not just close but optimal So when it comes to bees and them choosing to use a hexagonal tessellation, basically another, it's my math term for a honeycomb. A honeycomb is, a tessellation is where geometric objects fill up the whole space when they're put together like the hexagons do here. And um, well, uh, there's so much we could talk about here, but let me just put it to this. I, do I have, yeah, I have a slide on this. Um, I mean, mathematicians have done work. Thomas Hales, University of Michigan, talked about right here on this fourth line. He proved that bees have discovered the most efficient way of dividing the plane into equal size cells. And we, in, so really cool. In fact, there's, yeah, this is just a view of the first page of his proof, the honeycomb conjecture. And, uh, you know, what he says is, wow, these honeybees have chosen the most efficient way they could have for strength, holding power, and other things. They they really did it the best they could have. Of course, we know the bees didn't choose it, but the creator obviously designed it that way. Here you can see <clears throat> what <clears throat> a bunch of little spheres kind of attached to a larger sphere. And when we look at this more closely and you squish them in a little bit, you notice what happens? They automatically go to this hexagonal tessellation. Uh, that's the optimal thing. And it just happens, you know, when you squeeze these cylinders, they, they want to go to hexagons. And we see that shape all over in God's creation. Uh, this quote from... Coolidge, but the bee's skill in solving problems in maxima and minima does not end there. It was found on examination that the angle formed by the faces of the steeple, the steeple is that the bottom of the cell, you know, right there in the way in the bottom point. The angle formed by the steeple was such as to make the total surface area a gift a given volume a minimum. And so once again, just one result after another, like, wow, what clever bees. Wow, what an awesome and perfect creator. Um, yeah, this is the formula for that steeple on the bottom of the cells. And then check this out. So this is my one little plug for, I've been talking about what? Using the derivative to find max and min. But here we're going to see a little tiny bit about integration so oh there's so much here what well, first of all on the top when bees when the, the scouts go out and discover the good nectar sources they come back to the hive they communicate where the good stuff is to the other bees by using a dance which is is kind of outlined by the shape up here in the they they cycle around and they literally, what, waggle their tush. And how, 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 how vigorously they waggle their tail indicates distance, and what angle they're on indicates how far. Those are polar coordinates. So in other words, if you tell somebody what direction to go and how far to go, you can get points that way too. Those are called polar coordinates. Now, I mean, they're so good at this that scientists actually created a bionic bee that would do this dance and then they could program it to tell the bees to go wherever they wanted so they would program in such and such a place 
put the coordinates in, the robot bee would do the dance, and the bees would all go to that destination. It was like at the command. And then they thought, hey, let's pull one on the bees. Let's send them to the middle of a pond. And so they gave the coordinates for the middle of a, a small lake. You aren't going to believe this, but the bees never took off. So here, we could command them to go anywhere we want, but they didn't take off for that lake. It was kind of like, duh. There's no nectar there in the middle of the lake. They actually had some kind of a map, and they knew ahead of time, no way. Uh, incredible what uh, the Lord has put in his creation. So anyway, uh, experiment at the bottom indicates, oh, let's see, they know, uh, let's see, uh, the white part. How does the honeybee know how far she has gone? The answer, teased out by an elegant series of experiments, is that she integrates the speed of movement of images across her eyes. So, and they know this because they, they put different patterns. Anyway, pretty cool. So integration, differentiation, no problem for bees or for the creator anyway. Okay, let's move on to the leatherback turtle. Interesting design, the leatherback turtle. As you can see, their bodies have these, what, this teardrop shape. This gives them nearly ideal efficiency traveling through water. So those little ridges that they have on their back, we know from experiment, actually makes them slip through the water better. Um, okay, now this is really close, should be close to your heart. It's close to mine too. This is a picture inside a vein. Engineers also know in order to get the best flow of a liquid, such as blood, a pipe's cubed radius must equal the sum of the cubed radii of each of its branches. Now here's the great part. And this is exactly the relationship found in all living and fossilized creatures, from sponges to humans. Wow. So in other words, that whole circulatory system is set up to be optimal. And that is for the best flow. And of course, Flow is what it's all about when it comes to circulation. How about your, our red blood cells? What shape are they? Well, they're this biconcave shape that you see up here in the corner. We've, they're circular from one angle, but then they have this concave portion to them. Why? It so happens that this is the shape that has larger surface area than an ordinary sphere, and it's more efficient when gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide need to be transported across the membrane. Now, anyway, there's just, anyway, the bottom here, the biconcave shape naturally forms for this area to volume ratio because it requires the least energy, giving us the ability to live, you know, to have longer lasting life. Um, simple. The gravitational shape, a parabola, uh, is also very important when it comes to optimizing. Uh, the, the parabola, you can see on the right, you see a grinder and uh, all those sparks are parabolas. That's gravity shape. We all know that what? Any kind of a dish for communication is parabola in shape. Your Car headlamp reflectors are parabolas because they cause all the reflective rays to come out parallel, giving you more light. Uh, on the bottom here, they have tested different noses to go on spacecraft and airplanes. And you can see the one that requires the least amount of drag. By the way, that, that vertical axis is drag is the parabola. Yep, and that's why you see the nose shape that you see on airplanes. Uh, wish I had more time to talk to you about this, but this is another awesome design. The logarithmic spiral um, is all over in God's creation in shells. Here we have the Nautilus shell. Euler 
the mathematician we heard from earlier proposed that tracks like train tracks and even what exit ramps on freeways as you can tell on the left here use that it uh, works out for optimal slowing and turning without causing uh, too much sideways momentum uh, when you talk about optimal the sphere has got well maximum volume for minimum surface area if that was the only criteria that's the shape we would use on all our packaging and stores can you imagine the chaos though if everything was spherically packaged so what do we do in most cases we go halfway and we use the cylinder for many things uh, you know cans so when it when we look at the sphere well we realize we were all spheres when we were first conceived and the sphere is all around us today what do we got a little few raindrops and dew on the ground all of that goes back to the sphere when you do a little bit of 3D geometry, you find out that bubbles always operate with maxes and mins. And see how it says two bubbles merge in an arrangement which minimizes the total surface area? Um, just one thing after the other, creation points toward this incredible divine creator. Here's something simple, slime mold topology. A simple organism has the ability to find the minimum length solution between two points in a labyrinth. So here, you see, initially, it covers the entire, the entire maze, the slime mold. But after a while, it starts pruning. And you notice it's now only in certain areas. And eight hours after they introduced them to it, they found it the minimum the minimum solution <laughs> so slime mold knows its calculus um yeah you can read this one yourself but when it comes to uh what optimal coiling guess what dna is done as good as it could have been done no shock the Holy One of Israel is the designer. And that that neat design engineering team, the Holy Trinity Incorporated, uh, came up with the design. So here we got a uh, liquid logic. Um, you, I'm sure you know this by now. If you, with water, water always what? Seeks the easiest path. And it'll find the minimal way to get wherever it has to get automatically and you can see here they use liquids and, and and I get a lot of my information from the uh, British science magazine called nature I uh, wish I could talk to you more about Fibonacci's numbers but uh, the way plant nodes spiral this is that same spiral we saw in the chambered Nautilus a little while ago um, you know, evolutionists will say, well, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of the survival mode after millions of years. This is what happened. Uh, the, the researchers say Fibonacci spiraling is a result of the systems keeping the energy required for the growth of its parts to a minimum. And, of course, yeah, I wish, again, that's a, that's a divine design presentation. Um, I have it. Uh, one of you may have seen but most of you have not love to do it sometime optimal design in human hearing carnegie mellon scientists showed brain uses optimal code for sound results uh, they they've discovered that our ears use the most efficient way to process the sounds we hear from babbling brooks to wailing babies you want a better network Check out ants. Ants know you put a bunch of ants and and they need to get something from point A to point B, they'll find the most efficient way to get there. How about something as simple as coastlines? 
Have you ever heard of fractals? Well, a fractal is kind of what happens whenever water meets land. Uh, you get this ever finer, um, you know, nothing's straight. It's all got a, a pattern to it. And the closer you look at it, the more it breaks it down. And that's exactly how coastlines form. And guess, here's the cool thing right on the bottom. Fractal coastlines, which is what, how they are, are best at damping waves. That is, you know, receiving the waves and calming them down and uh, dis dis dispensing the energy. Now, it found, as you can see here, swimmers and flyers from insects to whales, even their speed is optimal. It says they cruise at the speed that lets them slip along the most easily. Researchers at the University of Oxford, United Kingdom. <coughs> so I didn't look up what plant this is, but we are starting to mimic it with fan blades because it's so efficient. Here is an example. Uh, phototropism is simply this idea that plants will, you know, lean toward the sunlight. And uh, the, all for maximum efficiency. So I guess that went a little quicker than I thought. But I, I just find it so cool. And now maybe you see why I got so fired up whenever we were talking about optimization. Obviously, our creator has, is really big on, you know, don't waste a thing. Make things as efficient as possible. Uh, not just close, but the best. And in order to do that, of course, the mathematical tool is the derivative. And, uh, well, our God has done a masterful job of that. So I'm going to, if I can find my way here, I'm going to unshare and see if you have, I don't know, any discussion, questions. So how long did it take you to uh, uh, research optimization itself? Oh, my. I, it's hard to say because I, I've done it in so many separate pieces. You know, it wasn't just one big project. I keep I keep bumping into new research. Um, so it would be impossible for me to answer. But I will tell you this. It's really It really started in 1978. So longest research project, I, and if someone had told me I would be involved in a lifelong research project, I would have told them they need serious mental help. But I just can't put it down. Anybody else comment, question? So I have recorded this. I will put the link where I usually put it. Thank you, dear students. I appreciate, uh, again, I appreciate your faithfulness. And uh, I'm going to start working on the review. So we're ready to go on the review tomorrow. I think uh, David had a comment. Um, he was wondering. Oh, yeah, David, thank you. Do you have the presentation published anywhere? Well, I was, uh, my plan was to produce a book. Uh, I just have not had a chance to do that. Uh, I do have um, I do have a website called divinemath.com. No spaces. Divinemath.com. You're welcome to go there and it shows all the parts of the it shows all the parts of the separate presentations that I have. This is the one that worked the best for calculus class. And so that's why. That's why I showed it to you. Sorry, David, I didn't see that up there. So I will be publishing the video. And uh, if you want to see more materials, I have about three, 
four chapters out of eight completed. And if you want, I could maybe share some some pages with some of you. Thank you again. God bless you. Thank you. See you tomorrow.